I command this mountain go. Be thou plucked up, removed, embraced into the sea. Oh, you mountain of crippling arthritis. Go. for him to walk. Listen, this is a mountain removed. Come on, Daddy. Come on. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. What do you think about it? Oh, it's wonderful. You're walking? Yes, I'm... What do you think about it? Oh, I... I don't know what to say. You're healed? Yes. Amen. Amen. No more than... This man couldn't walk except these, these crutches. He had to walk on this earth. Amen. Amen. This is his mountain. In every generation, there have been revivals massive moves of the spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. Welcome to Revival Radio TV. I'm your host, Gene Bailey. If I say A.A. A. Allen, what do you think of? What is it that you comes to your mind when I say A.A. Allen? Well, today, we're going to get you saying straight off, A.A. A. Allen, miracles. He was so bold, and God used him to break through in places no one previously had. In this journey, we have a very special guest today to help us out, his son, Paul Allen. He has untold stories of some of these miracles and what it was like to grow up Alan. For instance, he grew up next to a boy who could see, but had no eyeball. Pretty interesting, huh? What a childhood he had. You could say he definitely had a childhood full of exciting traveling adventures. So come with me as we go on this journey today and check out behind the scene insights and stories. On the road, going from city to city, state to state. Was there any, anything that ever happened? It must have been an exciting time. Did you ever remember any stories about anything happening? Oh, there were, I guess, as many stories as there were moves, but uh, we, we had a lot of time. Every time we would uh, get to a new city, it was like having a new playground, a new set of challenges. Uh, all the way from one time uh, Kent Rogers and I were swimming in a sandbar in the Los Angeles area and, and pulled a, a kid that was drowning out of the sandbar. Oh, and wow. uh, we got him out of the, on the dry land and he looked at us and started crying and turned around and ran off. Mm. One time Kent and I were uh, going from Pittsburgh down somewhere in the south because we went south across Pennsylvania and went over a mountain range. And one of the trucks we had was a bob-nosed white. And it had a clutch that operated off a vacuum system rather than off a pressure system. And when we went over the summit of the mountain, the guy that was driving the truck was a volunteer. He didn't really know how to drive and shouldn't have been driving. But he tried to shift down a gear and kill the engine and instead of using what air pressure he had at the moment and stopping, he kept trying to start it until he ran the battery down. And we ended up going down the, the side of a mountain in neutral 
oh, with wow. n with no gears and no brakes. And at the bottom of the hill, there was a, a river with a town just before you got to the river. And the people that lived in that town were so used to trucks going through there out of control that most of the traffic stayed on the side streets. And a policeman saw us coming down through there. We couldn't even blow the horn to let him know we were coming. And he recognized what was going on and, and got in front of us with his siren going. And we followed him through town at a little over 100 miles an hour, according to what he said. Wow. And uh, it, we came real close to not making that. That, yeah, praise and God. And that's a matter of a miracle <clears throat> that, that happened miracle. to me in Washington, Idaho. We had a, a, a mixture of white people, black people, some Indians. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody really even thought anything of that. Period. Then we got to Tyler, Texas. In Tyler, Texas, it was against the law to hold a public meeting with both blacks and whites in the same place, period. So what did your dad do about that? They said, that, that's not God's law. That's, that's your law. We're going to do this. If you want to arrest me, I'll be right there. You can walk in during the service and put me in handcuffs and carry me out if that's what you want to do. But you better think about it real hard before you do that in front of a lot of people. They didn't do it. And that was when we began to have trouble with the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. Tyler is out in East Texas and much more part of the Deep South right. than Dallas is. Yep. Uh, I can remember him getting on the platform saying, you people said you were going to shoot me if I preach tonight. I'm here. I'm about to preach. If you're going to shoot me, do it right now mm. because I don't want this thing to go on. We're going to have service. If you're here to shoot me, get up and do it. I don't think you've got the nerve. And the police would stand up and say, don't say that. Don't say that. They'll do it. They never did. Mm. Although one time a guy tried uh, in an auditorium meeting where a, a balcony wrapped around next to the platform, the guy's wife had been coming to the meeting. She'd go home and try to repeat the sermon. She was giving him the offering and he was mad and he brought his gun and he sat in the corner of the balcony. And when daddy had come down to the, that side of the platform, he'd try to shoot him. And his gun wouldn't fire. And he went out in the alley and squeezed the trigger and shot himself in the foot. Uh. <laughs> and uh, they brought him inside and daddy prayed for him. It quit bleeding and they took him to the hospital and patched him up. We were holding a meeting in Atlanta with the big tent. And... Uh, at that point, no evangelist had ever had a black person as part of their platform crew, whether it was a pianist, organist, mm -hmm. singer, preacher. It, that just, there wasn't a, a single black minister who had ever done that, period. And we were in Atlanta. We were having an awful lot of black people coming to the meetings. And at that point, the way daddy had kind of dodged the law when it said you can't have integrated meetings, we had a section where the black people were. And when there were more of them than what would fit in one, they'd have two sections and then three. And they'd run a rope down the side. And uh, daddy wanted to have somebody sing in the meeting that was going to touch some of those black people's hearts. Right. And he asked one of the local preachers about it. And he said, well, I know there's a young man here in town that is a great singer. You might want to have him sing in a couple of services. And I think he started by singing in a couple of the afternoon services. And it went over great. Daddy loved him. And 
uh, after two or three meetings where he sang in the afternoon services, he started singing in the evening service. And at some point toward the end of that meeting, Daddy hired him full time as as the solo singer, and he he sang all the time for us after that. And he is my dad was the person that introduced integrated meetings. Within six months to a year after we hired Gene Martin, every major evangelist had a black person on the platform staff. Why? So what's this about Gene Martin? Um, while he was singing, he went down and knocked the sign down that said white and black. Well, Gene Martin would, would sing and he would get dancing in the spirit and sometimes he'd be on the platform. Sometimes he'd jump down off the platform onto the ramp and get down in the sawdust. And uh, there was a rope down there. And I think sometimes there was a sign that said colored and uh, sometimes there wasn't a sign. Mm -hmm. And I think that particular night there was. And he was dancing down there and got over into the rope and knocked the rope down and the sign was tied to the rope and it went down. And uh, the next night somebody said something about, uh, are you going to put that rope back up? Daddy said, the Lord knocked it down. If he wants it up, he can put it up. Wow. That's huge. That was it. That was huge. And that's... That's the way my dad thought. Yeah. He, uh, there's never been one like him before no, since. He was, you know, when I watch his videos and even when I read things he wrote, the amount of faith this man had is just, I, I take great pleasure in watching him when he sees somebody come up uh, and uh, I think one of my favorites is when he's talking about a guy with a that had a stomach cancer, and he and he comes in on a stretcher, and he says, "Go get him a a glass of milk and a sandwich," and he and he lays hands on him, yep. and then there's a but there is never you don't see a flinch, you don't see a doubt. I mean, he just goes down there and takes care of it. Well, one of the things Daddy never did. There are preachers today that will pray for the sick, but they'll do it around and back. And then if they get healed, they'll bring them out and testify. Daddy never did that. Daddy brought them right across the ramp. Right. Had the TV cameras rolling. And he believed that God could and God would heal anybody. People have asked me throughout my life if there's any one single thing that sets your dad totally apart from other people. What was it that made him so different than all the other preachers of the day? And my answer to that, plain and simple, is he had more faith than anybody I've ever known of. But he also had the ability to transfer that faith to people. Uh, tell me about the $10,000 reward. The Church of Christ, every place we would go on Saturday before we would open the meeting on Sunday, they would run a full page ad with a $10,000 reward for anybody that could prove somebody was healed by prayer. Well, you know, there were thousands of people that were, but their out was, well, you can't, yeah, they did have this and now they don't. Right. But you can't prove that the prayer is what did it. So they never paid the $10,000 and people would ask daddy, well, why don't you make them stop doing that? He said, why would I want to stop them? That's, that's a full page ad for me that I don't have to pay for. Yeah. And then we, would, we knew it was going to be there. So we would 
on either the page across from it or the next page behind it, we'd buy that page. We'd say, God does heal. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. Come see people healed. Mm. What do you think your dad's greatest miracle was? Salvation. Salvation was, is, always will be the single greatest miracle. That is what changes lives. Mm. The single greatest event that God does is change the heart of the sinner. Yes. Um, and I just, I, I believe that with all my heart. I really, really do. Um, I agree with you. And the, the one that I tell for myself, I tell three stories in that chapter. But the one that I tell for myself is about Ronald Coyne. And the reason for that is he and I were within a few months of each other the same age. When we were little kids, he and his mother would come to our meeting and be there for a weekend every month at, at toward the end of the meeting. Mm -hmm. He and his mother would be there and he and I were buddies and ran around and did all the things that little boys do, you know, chasing the girls and all the other stuff. But he had had an eye put out as a child. They took him to the doctor. Doctor put in a prosthesis. I don't remember if it was plastic or glass. Doesn't matter. It was totally opaque. You couldn't hold it up to the sun and even see any light coming through it. And when he got saved, it was a lady holding a tent revival and he had the, a cold or something and he went up um, to be prayed for. And she noticed that one of his eyes didn't look quite right. And she said, um, there's something wrong with one of your eyes. It, it, one of them looks different. He said, I can't see out of that eye. And she said, well, would you like for God to heal him? He said, yes. She just prayed that God would heal his eye and that he'd be able to see out of that eye. If she had known it was a plastic eye or a glass eye, she might have worded her prayer differently. Mm. She just prayed that he'd be healed and he could see out of that eye. They covered up his other eye. He could see. And that was a continuous miracle that happened every single day for the rest of his life. Right. I can remember when we were kids sitting at a soda stand in a drugstore and he'd take it out and put it in a glass of water and put a napkin over it and turn it upside down and put it on the counter. The waitress would come and look at her, what's that? He'd say, I don't know, what is it? pick up the glass and the water would run everywhere and he'd pick that up and put it back in his head. <laughs> we did things that most boys don't do. <laughs> but that was a miracle that I saw right. growing up one week in the month for years. And it happened every day of his life right. for the rest of his life. But when you run a full page ad in the newspaper with a picture of it and tell that this boy has one eye missing and he can see out of the other eye and you can come and you can bring down your driver's license and let him read it to you and show you. And every time we would do that, there would be at least two, three, four, sometimes a dozen eye doctors would be in the, in the tent that night 
because they'd have people come into them during the week and say, what do you think about this? Right. So I don't believe that. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to prove it. And daddy would say, is there any, are there any doctors in the crowd that would like to tape up this other eye? And they'd put a couple of hankies on it and then get that big white surgical tape and they'd always use a lots of it. You know, they'd wrap it all the way around. You, you didn't necessarily try to make it look as nonchalant as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. But once they got that taped up and it, it was totally impossible to see anything out of it, then they would have a line of people come up with driver's license or a letter or a card or whatever and have him look at it. And the doctors would always be the first ones they would let look at it. And then daddy'd say, okay, you help tape that eye. Are you sure that's taped up good enough he can't see that? Yeah. It's taped up good enough. Well, what do you think about this? I don't know what to think about it. Right. Some of them would actually say, it can't be anything in the world except God. Yeah. And so that was my story about the most incredible thing I ever saw. Tell me about R.W. Schambach's miracle that he talked about. Well, R.W. Schambach, Bob Schambach as I know him, was almost like a father to me. Matter of fact, there've been times when we referred to each other that way. In his, when he talks about the greatest miracle he ever saw, he does not talk about a miracle that happened under his ministry. He talks about a miracle that happened under daddy's ministry. And it was a little boy in Alabama that was healed of 26 different ailments or diseases, whatever you want to, however you want to categorize them, however you want to categorize them. Uh, and that was what Bob considered to be, or R.W. Schambach considered to be, the greatest miracle he ever saw during his ministry for all of it, both before daddy, during the time he was with daddy, and when he was on his own. And the little boy was healed on the spot. Uh, I have a good friend in Alabama today that was in that meeting. He was, he was a boy at the time, and he said that it just blew him away and his parents had him there and he was eight or 10 years old at the time. A lot of people ask if that's the same boy that sometimes referred to as the monkey boy and it's not, it's two different, mm -hmm. totally different situations. But um, there are other people that would, would think that that uh, of the monkey boy, uh, yeah, would sure. would be the one that would come to anybody's mind, and and it's um, it's definitely in the top four or five. So, <laughs> that's good. but that that's a situation if you don't know what it is. That uh, uh, he was six or seven years old. He had never spoken a word. He had never taken a step. He couldn't take a bite. He was to put it bluntly, what a lot of people would refer to as a vegetable. Um, they filmed the entire thing for about two, two and a half hours. They edited that down to a 30 minute TV program. In the beginning of the program, he just kind of like that. And by the end of the program, he's running across the platform and jumping into daddy's arms. Yeah. Literally, of his own power, just getting down and running 12, 14 feet and jumping into daddy's arms. And what I like about that particular thing is it shows daddy's humanity, I think, better than any other situation on film. I was just going to ask you, how did this affect your dad? I mean, you can't have revival meetings and see such great healings night after night. 
and 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 not a, what did he do after the meeting? Would you church usually get over somewhere between eleven thirty and twelve, twelve thirty, sometimes one, but mm -hmm. we'd usually go out to eat, come back, we'd go in the trailer house and go to bed, he'd go over to the office and pray. Sometimes be up most of the night praying and come in, go to bed three, four, five o'clock in the morning, get up mid morning and do the whole thing again. And that's something you just mentioned um, about A.A. A. Allen that I don't think a lot of people realize is that he was a man of prayer. Very much he was so. Very much a man of prayer. We had Sam Nix on here and he'd talk about how he would, he would stay in the house and would hear him praying all night long and uh, how he would pray and he would fast. Another thing that your dad would fast. It was not unusual for him to fast 30 days at a time on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, we used to jokingly refer to his closet as fat man clothes and skinny man clothes. And when he'd, when he'd fast, he'd have to wear the skinny man clothes. Oh Lord, I lay hands on this man in the name of Jesus. Oh God, it's, it, it's taking place right now. Yes it is, yes it is. This is God's power. Right now, Lord, cursed be this devil of cancer. Thou spirit of infirmity, I find you in the name of Jesus. It's done. I feel it, it is done. In Jesus' name. your bed and wall. Bring me the next wheelchair. On Revival Radio TV, you know, we talk about these tent meetings and what it must have been like and the miracles that were there. But we also talk about how important the Word is and how important prayer was and how vital spending time with God is. We talk about targeting your faith and seeing amazing breakthroughs. A.A. A. Allen, he lived all of this. He lived it all. Whether he fasted for 30 days or what we heard about, he would spend all night in prayer after the crusade meeting. This was truly an amazing man. He was definitely blessed to see life-changing miracles. And it's said that A.A. Allen was one of the most persecuted evangelists of his time. But you know, what I see is a man with a miracle ministry and how many ways God used it to unify a hurting people and bring healing and wholeness to the family of God. So as you go about your week, I want to encourage you, take time and see what God has for you and what breakthroughs He wants to do with you in your life and in your family and your environment. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for coming our way today, right here. We'll see you on Revival Radio TV.